just if we stop and think about it, if we are what we think, if we're just thinking beings, we're just thinking things, filling our minds with more information, if we are what we think, then shouldn't we develop and form as Christians and grow because we are processing more and more information? And yet, don't you know, wouldn't you agree that there is really no correlation between what we know and what we do? That, that quite often we're doing the opposite of what we know is right. Yep. That we have deep in our hearts this propensity for things that contradict what we know. And so we have to get beyond the intellect, uh, James K.A. Smith contends. Have you ever noticed that so much of what we do is done in the subconscious? Have you, ever, have you ever left home, as we did not too long ago? We were taking Marjolene to the oncology center. Arbel was driving, and halfway there she said, did I put the garage door down? And not, none of us could remember her doing that. And so she called the neighbor. She texted the neighbor, and the neighbor went, look, it's down. But we can't remember. She couldn't remember putting it down, and we couldn't remember observing that because you know why? Because it's done in, it's not something we think about. It's something we do simply in the subconscious mind. Have you ever driven a far away home from work and not remember driving home? Have you ever left your job the boss ticked you off and you were so mad and you called somebody on the phone and you were so animated in the car telling them all the stuff that happened to you all day long and while you're doing it and while you're doing it and while you're doing it you end up where home and you don't remember stopping at the light you don't remember how you got home how did you get home you got home in the subconscious you didn't think about getting home you didn't think about driving. And if you stop and think about it, um, those who study the science, they say that 80% of what we do each day is done in the subconscious. Only 20% of what we do is done consciously. Think about breathing. Have you thought about breathing lately? We just breathe. We don't think about breathing. We don't think about swallowing. We just swallow when we start eating. James K. Smith tells the cute story of the two little fish. They were swimming merrily down the stream, and suddenly this big fish just swam up beside them, and he said, hey, how's the water? And they looked very curiously at the big fish, and he looks at them and there's no answer and he's a little bit frustrated so he just swims off and as he swims away one of the little fish said to the other fish what the heck is water water <laughs> water is natural to a fish's environment They've never known anything other than water, so they don't even know what water is. And the whole point of talking about habits is because habits are things we do in the subconscious. We, we have grown to be this way, to do this thing, to act this way. We do it subconsciously. And the whole point of talking about habits as we start out in this new year is to simply say, this is water. This is a life. And you've been swimming in it all your life, conscious or not. 
We are not thinking beings. Descartes, I think, therefore I am, is a wrong philosophy. And the scripture passage that we read earlier from Philippians chapter 1, if you will just turn there, if you will, Philippians 1, beginning with verse 7, you will notice in the first few verses, verses 7, 7 and 8, that uh, the Apostle Paul is expressing his his um, fond affection for this local congregation. Paul loved the Philippian church. In fact, the letter to the Philippians is the one letter in the New Testament that isn't fraught with problems. He's not correcting a problem. He's just writing to a church that he really loves. Unlike Corinthians, unlike Galatians, unlike, you know, even Ephesians, Philippians, Paul has what he calls a fond affection for them. Paul says, well, we'll drop down to verse 9, because in verse 9, based on this fond affection that he has for the church in Philippi, verse 9, he now says, here is how I pray for you. Here is what I pray for you all the time. I pray, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Here's what you need to see in the verses that I just read. Give me one moment here. Correct my page. In these verses, Paul doesn't say, Paul doesn't begin with knowledge. Paul doesn't begin by saying, I pray that your knowledge would grow. I pray that your knowledge would abound. I pray that you would learn more about Jesus and inculcate more biblical principles. No, Paul says, my prayer is that your love would abound. It begins not with what you know, but with what? what we love, what we love. One could get the impression that what we, what we think is what's most important in our walk as believers. But no, Paul begins here, Paul is praying that their love might abound more and more because in some sense, love is the condition of knowledge. And, and you know, you know Paul, Paul says this even more clearly in the book of um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great love chapter. We had a sermon on that a few uh, back in the fall, late last year. You have all the knowledge in the world, but you don't have love, you're nothing. Love, love is the condition of knowledge, not the other way around. We've been taught to believe that if you can just know some more, learn some more, memorize some more, and there are those who teach little children and they believe all we have to do is pour information into them and pump them with more Bible verses. No, no, no. Doesn't mean you don't pour Bible verses into them. It means that you, you do it in the right sequence. You begin to address in their lives what it is that they truly, really love. This is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. Um, let me. Paul, Paul goes on to say, 
if you want to discern what is best, if you want to discern what is excellent, if you want to be, be, be blameless in the day of Jesus Christ, if you want to be filled with all the fruits of righteousness, the place to start is not with knowledge, but with what we love. There is something deeper that drives what we're thinking. There is something deeper that drives what, we, what our hearts go after, and that thing that drives it is our desire. And our desires, they have to do with what we want, and what we want has to do with what we love. You are what you love because we live toward what it is that we actually want. What we believe is good for us. What we have in our hearts, in our minds, as the vision of what is good. What is the good life? And we go after that. And James K. A. Smith ends up saying that what we need to understand is that love is a habit. Love is a habit. Can we say that together? Love is a habit. You know, um, St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, who said, Lord, in his prayer, Lord, you have created us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. Augustine didn't say, Lord, you have created us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until we learn more about you. He says, our hearts are restless. And, and he points to heart because that is the seat of our human emotion, and that is the seat of our desire, and that is where the, the engine is that drives what it is that we go after. So, all of that to say, in the month of January, we started out talking about growing forward, growing forward. And in that message, Dr. Iams asked us to think about a habit, a habit that has grown on us, a habit that we're not proud of, a habit that... You know, we, we've developed, but, you know, she asked us to think about how that habit got started, what drives, what feeds that habit, and again, that goes back to the heart, goes back to love, our desire. She had us to think about that, and I hope that you have identified that habit, and I hope that you're bringing that before Jesus. Then she walked us through the seven habits of highly effective people. And I bought a new copy of this book to give to somebody who might want to read this if you are an avid reader. Stephen Covey, back in the 1990s, wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's based on research, it's not just hearsay. And let's, let's just walk through those seven habits very quickly. Habit number one, be proactive. Be proactive. Life isn't just happening to you. Don't just let life happen to you. Be proactive. Focus on the things that you can change, not on the things that you can change. And so many of us spend our whole lives trying to change circumstances, change people, regret what, what happened to us or didn't happen to us. And um, Kavi says, no, be proactive. Focus on the things that you can change. Forget about the things you can change. And don't just let life happen to you. Life happens, but life doesn't have to happen to you. You can direct the course of your life by the grace of God. Be proactive. Number two, habit number two, begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. Start the day thinking about what you want to feel like at the end of the day. If you're still very young, 
Think about your life as you go forward as to what you would like life to be when you're 45 and 50 and 60. Begin with the end in mind. In his book, The Road to Character, uh, David Brooks talks about the difference between eulogy virtues and resume virtues. And he says, we live in a world today where people are after resume virtues. Here's my resume. Here's what I wrote up about me, my resume virtues. But he says, back in the day, people were more concerned about eulogy virtues. Not my resume, but my eulogy. Because you see, one of these days, I'm going to be gone. One of these days, I won't be here. One of these days, you'll be at my funeral. And what are they going to say? That's about eulogy. Eulogy. Begin with the end in mind. Uh, habit number three, put first things first. Learn to prioritize. Learn the habit of prioritization. Habit number Four, think win-win. Think win-win. Andy Stanley has a new book and a new series out called We're Not In It to Win It about the whole political climate of our country and how evangelical churches, evangelical churches are caught up into all of that. And we have to learn that the church isn't here to win anything. The only thing that the church is here to win are souls, not elections. And when we think win-win, we realize that I am not here to win over you. I'm not here to outdo you, no. Because every time I win over you, I lose some of me in the process. We have to think win-win. That's habit number four. Habit number five, Seek first to understand and then to be understood. Most often, I want to be understood before I understand. Seek first to under, seek first to be to understand and then to be understood. Number six, synergize. One word, synergize. To synergize is to seek collaboration, to bring together synergy, to bring together those pieces of our lives into one, to become one with someone else in collaborating, to achieve something because we're better together. And number seven, habit number seven, sharpen the saw. Sharpen the saw. And this habit is, interestingly, is subtitled Principles of Balanced Self-Renewal. Principles of Balanced Self-Renewal. Sharpen the saw. You've been on the airplane, I'm sure, and you've heard the flight attendant go through the ritual, the routine, when the cabin doors close about the oxygen, ma oxygen masks that will fall from the ceiling and what to do, put the band over your head, pull it tight and all that. And what do we do when they're doing that? We tune that out. What do they say? In the event of an emergency, and guess what? We're not planning on an emergency. So we just kind of tune that out. But the part that usually we at least give mental assent to is the last part where they say that in the event you're traveling with an infant or someone who needs help, what are you supposed to do? Put your mask on first and then help the person with their mask. Why? Because if you're out of oxygen, you can't help anybody. The issue of sharpening the saw is that we need to live from a place of rest and renewal in Jesus. 
that, that running ourselves crazy is not a virtue. And we have to stop saying it's just the way I am because Jesus Christ has saved you and calls it as something else. Calls it as something better, something new. So these seven habits, uh, Andy Stanley came after, and for the past three weeks, we've been talking about living with yourself. Three habits to safeguard your soul. And we walk through those, those three habits. And remember what they are. Brother John just went over them. We walk through them, but let's walk through them again. Just, just so we don't forget. The first habit is to surrender your will. Let's say that together. Surrender your will. Every day, all the time, surrendering your will. To get up in the morning as you roll out of the bed, to pick, put your feet down. Don't get up yet. Just say, Lord, glorify yourself today at my expense. Surrender your will. Secondly, the second habit, monitor your heart. Let's say that together. Monitor your heart. Lord, put a watch over my heart because bad things get in it. In fact, it's interesting, it's interesting <laughs> when, when we talk about monitoring our heart, we're not just talking about monitoring our heart because of what could get into it. We're talking about monitoring our heart because of what flows out of it. Because that's what the Bible says. Out of it flows what? All the issues. We surrender our will, we monitor our hearts, and thirdly, we live with open hands. Can we say that together? We live with open hands. When our hands are open, we're not holding on to things. And when our hands are open, we're letting go. When our hands are open, we are more vulnerable, but at the very same time, we are, we are available. We are at the place where we can receive what God wants to put into our hands. Because when our hands are closed, especially closed tight, we can't get a hold of what, what God wants to do in our lives. So what does this all mean? Where do we go from here? How do we wrap up a good series? For one thing, it's a brand new year. We're only a month in. There's still time to reorder our lives and our priorities. To order our private worlds, to order our spiritual priorities. We are creatures of habit. As we heard during the first message, you sow a thought, you reap an action, you sow an action, you reap a habit, you sow a habit, you reap a character, you sow a character, you reap a destiny. This is, this is too important to miss. And you'll remember, you've heard me talk about Dallas Willard, and Dallas Willard asked the question, you know, this whole thing about redemption. We are the products of God's loving redemption through Jesus Christ. And all that God has done to redeem us by sending his son and, and Calvary and the crucifixion and, and so much God has done to redeem us. The question is, what is, it in, what is there in it for God? And we know what's in there for us. But what's in it for God? And Dallas Willard says that what God gets out of this deal is the person we become. The person we become deep down in our hearts. One of the most 
One of the most sobering quotes that I have come across in recent years is where John Maxwell says, and I, I take this seriously as a preacher, he says that we, can, we, we teach and preach what we know, but we can only reproduce what we are. We teach and preach what we know. We can only reproduce what we are. And what we are is more important than what we know. And our resume virtues are not nearly as important as our eulogy virtues. As, as we become what we are, we want to become people of virtue. And we want to concentrate on the right virtues. And Stephen Covey, the author of the seven, the seven habits, he talks about the way he talks about this. He talks about the difference between the personality ethic and the character ethic. The personality e ethic is, you know, you, you understand what personality is, but that's different from character. What is character? Your character is the internal script that determines how you respond to the things that happen to you in life. My character is who I am deep down on the inside. My character is what determines how I relate to the challenges, to the failures that happen in my life. It is more than, re it is more it is more far-reaching than my talents, my education, my background, my network of friends. Andy Stanley says, those things can open doors for you, but your character will determine what happens after you walk through those doors. Your good looks may get you a man or a woman, but your character is what makes you stay married, at least happily married. Your God-given reproductive system may enable you to have children, he says, but your character will determine your ability to relate to and communicate with those children. Andy Stanley, in his book, Louder Than Words, pages 20 and 21, just in case you need the reference. So let me, let me wrap up, let me, let me conclude just by saying a couple things very quickly. As we've been talking about habits the past, the past month, what we are trying to do is to live above the daily grind of life and to avoid the things that kill us spiritually in fact, there are three things that we need to be careful of as Christians, the three pitfalls of the Christian life. You can, you know, you can list a hundred of them, but to summarize, just boil them down to three. Here they are. The three things that could happen to us as Christians. Number one is spiritual barrenness. Barrenness. We become barren in our spiritual lives. The second thing is emotional bitterness. We become bitter because life happens, things happen to us, they lodge in our hearts, we don't deal with them, and we become bitter. So you've got barrenness, you've got bitterness. And then the third one, which seems a lot innocent to a lot of people, but it still keeps us from growing spiritually, and that is personal busyness. Personal busyness. Spiritual barrenness, emotional bitterness, and personal busyness. What is the end goal? How do we get past these? What is the secret to spiritual flourishing? We wrote on those, on those cards and put them in the box here at the altar. And we want to grow this here. We want, we want to flourish. And we want God to establish the work of our hands and bless us in 2024. How do, we, how do we move in that direction? Number one, we need 
the harmonization of our divergent selves. What Andy Stanley has been saying for the past three weeks is that we have this outer self and we have this inner self. We have, we have, the, we have our public persona and we have our inner private life. And the goal of Christian discipleship is to bring both of those into closer and closer harmony. We all have a public life and a private life. But what we, what we want is that our private life should not look much different than our public life. The harmonization of our two selves. So we have, we have what we might call singleness of heart. A heart that is undivided. That's the, first, that's the first thing that we're after this year. The second thing is the recalibration of our hearts. The heart needs to be recalibrated. Because the heart is the seat of our desire and our desires drive our actions and our habits. Because we go after what we love we want what we love, so we go after what we love, and therefore we have to recalibrate our heart. And the goal of heart recalibration is that the same way that we drove home and not even realized we were driving home, the same way we breathe and not realize we're breathing, because we're not doing it by consciousness, we're doing it simply by habit. The same way that we do those things by habit, that Jesus is calling us in this day, in this moment, to develop new habits of the heart that become so commonplace to us, become so much a part of who we are, and the way we think and the way we act and what we do, that we, even, we do them subconsciously. That's the goal. It takes intentionality. You have to do this by intention. And it takes practice. Practice, 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 because practice makes perfect. And as Sister Nicole told us in the first message, the way you kill a habit is by developing a habit that outdoes that habit. And uh, there is an old sermon that was preached many years ago by a preacher, uh, Thomas Chalmers. It's called The Explosive Power of a New Habit the explosive power of a new affection. But if you, if you have this habit of loving this thing, the way you overcome that love is by the explosive power of a habit that, that, that makes you loathe that thing. The explosive habit of a new affection. He says, bondage to sin is broken by a stronger attraction, a more compelling joy, or as Charles, as Charles uh, Chalmers says, the explosive power of a new affection. That's the goal. That's the charge. That's where we're going this year. That's where God called Abraham in Genesis 12 to go with them into a whole new way of living. That's where God calls Joshua to go and to take the people of Israel from a life 40 years in the desert. All their habits that they developed and the things that they look forward to every day, manna falling from the sky. And now they need to go to Canaan and learn to plant their own gardens and take care of their own homes and build and, and live a life. And it's difficult, but it's possible. And God calls us to that. And the reason we're doing this, the reason we're forming new habits, the reason we're walking with the Lord down this path this year is because we want victory in our personal lives. We want victory for our families. 
We want people who are living in bondage to be set free. We want people to learn to experience the joy of walking with Jesus above misery and depression. And brothers and sisters, we need to speak Jesus into that. Jesus for my family. Jesus for my marriage. Jesus for my church. Jesus for my community. Jesus for my world. Jesus. Jesus. And as we speak Jesus, and as we act with intentionality, and as we surrender our will and monitor our hearts and live with open hands, Watch what God's going to do.